Hello, chess friends. This is International Master Valero Leof, and welcome to tonight's uh, lecture on YouTube. I had some problem with the YouTube uh, broadcast, so uh, it's working now. I had to restart it a couple of times, but uh, it's working out now, I think. And I do hope you can all hear me well. Uh, so, um, actually, uh, today we're going to be talking about Grandmaster Roman Jinjiashvili and his unique approach to teaching. Now, I got to say that it was, you know, it was me who actually benefited a lot from just watching his lectures. And that's how I got inspi inspired in regards to teaching. In fact, this is how I first really got my f real inspiration to really begin teaching. And so today I'd like to share with you some of the things that have had most impact on me as a chess player and the thing the most important things that i believe you can get from roman's teaching there are countless countless number of videos on youtube and also on the link below this video that will teach you a lot about you know roman's approach you can actually get some amazing courses for an extremely cheap price especially with a discount but let me bring you some of my own insight actually based on some of Roman's actual games that he played. So we're going to start with um, a few classical games that he's played and uh, I, I personally consider them really beautiful. So I'd like to bring them over. The first game, uh, in fact it's, uh, we're not going to start directly with a Roman's game, that's I'm going to leave for the last part. Uh, we're going to start with a game that was actually played between Michel Tal and Lajos Portish. Yes, Michel Tal's game. Now, are you excited? I am. This is an incredible game. And I, I, every time when I see it, I get more and more excited. That was the candidates match between Tal and Portish in 1965. Even if you considered this to be an old game, it still becomes one of the timeless classics that Roman has suggested every chess player must study. So Michel Tal was actually playing with White, and uh, uh, the Hungarian famous grandmaster, Lash Portish, was black. So we go with the Karakan defense, knight c3, d5, and knight f3. To all of you who are wondering what is White doing and why he isn't playing d4, this type of approach gives White a little more flexibility, and it kind of challenges Black to play d4 first, which will actually get this pawn attacked, so White can also do knight g3 and get a really good position. So anyway, after knight f3, Black played d takes to the e4, and knight takes d4, bishop to the g4, and this is the time where White played out with the move h3. Now, I'd like to point something out in this position. Um, the move of h3 kind of provides Black with a choice. He can bring his bishop down to h5, or he can actually choose to exchange it on the f3. There are these two moves that make the most sense, and I guess they don't look so bad. But what's important about this position is that uh, wherever black goes, white certainly has good opportunities. I mean, even in the live book, you could see that a lot of people who've tried bishop to h5 haven't really gotten into very good positions. You can realize there is an exchange which will double the black pawns, or if black plays knight d7, um, you know, white can even drive away that bishop at some point, play h4. This this will rather transpose into some of the main lines. But anyway, um, Portage did, in my opinion, a positional mistake. He committed the move bishop takes f3, which I wouldn't say is necessarily a huge mistake, but it gives white the opportunity to take the bishop pair advantage and then further on support it with a great control in the center. d4 knight g to f6, and bishop d3. But now we're going to talk about an aspect of the strategy that a lot of players tend to miss. How do you convert a positional advantage? Imagine this. A lot of people, I'm talking about masters and not only, have often been in such a position. They get an advantage of more space, more control, or restriction to the opponent, and then they don't know what to do with it. They feel good and prepared, but... In reality, it just feels like there is not a whole lot to do with this. So they leave it and they say, okay, I'm just going to go on with my play. And if something goes right, it will be great. But really, that's kind of 
sad because there's so much more that they can get. So this game of Tal can teach you the most important skill of all when it comes down to positional play. How do you convert a small advantage and turn it into a bigger one? So here's point number one. Keep things simple. Remember that the positional advantage is a long-term advantage. If you try to utilize it quickly, you'll likely fail. And that could actually risk not only your whole advantage, but your position. So don't go quickly. If, if your advantage is tactical, you might want to go quick because you're going to lose it. But a positional advantage, like more space and control, the only thing you have to do fast is to make sure you prevent any fast way for your opponent to counter you. So right now, I think all that White wanted to do was just to continue the development. He got those three pawns very well supported. He has the queen and the bishop challenging over h7, and everything looks fine. So here's my question to you guys. I want to make this lecture as interactive as possible. So my question to you is where do you think White's queen must go to? What's the best place for the White queen to move so that you can have uh, more value and um, can help better this position? and the different possibilities. So take a second and think about this. I really want to hear your thoughts, so let me know what you think. What should white do now? So I have to say that it's a very good position. You know, we have a nice development. The queen is being challenged, though. So what to do now? Where do we go with that queen? Do we move it back? Do we move it up? Queen f3. I don't mind that. But you see, the queen wouldn't do anything. Do you know how you can find the best place for a certain piece to be? Look for a position which can help you to apply most pressure. Like h4. As opposed to f3, What's really interesting here with that square is that the queen isn't just going to be nice. It is going to apply pressure. Pressure versus black's h7. Pressure against this development. And, and that's something we care about. Remember that the pressure by itself is a great advantage. So you'd like to consider this first and then look for anything else. I believe Tal knew very well that having the queen go to h4, even if it doesn't necessarily win, it's going to just hold certain tension and thereby keep black on the edge, just having to defend and feeling a little lost in regards to how he should play. So black played knight d5, and after queen g4, he made bishop f6. It wasn't really anything that special. I guess what black wanted to do was just to move the bishop around and then keep everything protected. It felt right. It really did. Why not? Let's get the G7 covered. Let's have the possibility to castle. Let's make sure, you know, all the all the good squares and all the good pieces come at one. Well, that really felt good. And it's very interesting that Tal didn't hurry. You wouldn't expect it. But in fact, a lot of the positional success in many games <laughs> starts with quiet, gradual moves, at least until we get enough of what we really need enough of the tension, enough of the pressure and the possibilities. So White knew that, and he just wanted to make things better. He wanted to make things, um, you know, a little stronger, a little more powerful at that point. So let's take a look. After that last move of Rook to the E1, things are really going uh, quite nice. And I have to say, it's almost perfect. I mean, it's, I'm not going to say that it is perfect, but it's it's the almost perfect type of position that we've got. So what is what are we supposed to do next? Okay, well, as soon as the rook came down on the e1 and white had the, all this preparation and setup, black played queen b6. So I want you to think. Consider this position from Tao's perspective. The development's ready. We've got the minimum set of pieces up there. And relevant we have good good command things are not bad I mean for the most part almost everything looks good what to do now now one of you asked why not Queen f3 why not Queen g3 because you see white just wanted to do two things 
have the queen more advanced and have the pressure ready so we have them both now could we do bishop g5 i think we could but you know if we do that he'll just take b2 and i don't really like that idea see tal knew he already got to the point where he can start thinking about making more pressure making more pr problems over over black's position so we need it it's not so much something we generally consider but we we just want to set more tension more things against uh, you know the the opponent's position so what to do now think about this what would you say is white's best move c4 thank you that's really good i mean if you really think about it this is an excellent candidate to follow up with we don't have to worry about any uh, tactics about any real challenges we just make the move of pawn to the c4 happen it's what we call what i like to call as a threat a serious threat and a very good idea to play with knight of the d5 <laughs> Okay, and uh, I, f I think it's perfect. Start with threats. Now, of course, when you begin with threats, you need to know it's absolutely perfect. You're absolutely ready to do this. But Tal knew most of Black's pieces being backward simply guarantee us this flawless opportunity to just jump in and attack. But how do you follow that up, you see? I think that's quite important. After continuing with the move of um, pawn up to the c4, now we have the opportunity to uh, like advance. Maybe we can do a move of pawn up to the d5, and uh, it's actually a great idea to come for, come forward and advance and attack. It's a great, lovely move to play with. So, how did Tal continue? It's so good, but then Black plays knight b4. Now it almost looks like we kind of failed. I mean didn't we? It did look like we had the potential and the possibility, but uh, to me, this looks like, wow, that was a really big mess up we just did into our position. It almost felt like the right move, and it turns out to be the wrong one. He's able to challenge and do, do certain things. Ah, damn. It looked so good at first, you know? No, 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 not anymore. So, what do we do? Now let's talk about this. You said maybe we can play bishop f5. I do like that move. But then black is just going to castle. He'll be simple. He'll, he'll quietly just go into the, you know, like in a safe position. And he'll be, uh, you know, pretty secure in this moment. And then, of course, after that type of position, he's just going to play with the move of, um, you know, like short castles. And, uh, you know, he's going to be actually pretty strong. You know that king may even go around, and, and he would be he'll be pretty safe. It's it's not it's not bad, but uh, I certainly don't think it was too good. So that just doesn't look great. So Tao would have lost all his initiative. I don't like that. I I don't feel like this would have worked out in the right way. And uh, certainly White, I feel like White wanted or he 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 was looking for a way to achieve more. So what other move? Rook takes to e6. So I got a question. So what was the right bishop move in the opening? Well, I think white did perfect. Black did the bad exchange. Perhaps he should have played bishop h5. It would have been the lesser evil. But then, instead of move jumping with the bishop, rook takes to e6 proves being brilliant. That move completely destroys everything inside black's position. It is terrific. Devastating is a move, and then in case he takes with the pawn, we can even move, you know beautifully move with the queen. F takes d6, queen takes d6. Now, a lot of people who do such kind of sacrifice will be like, um, okay, I know this is a Tal's game, so probably he's right, but damn, I can't do that myself. I'm gonna be really like sort of scared and and not comfortable when something like that happens. So are you sure about this, Valeri? Truth be told, you can never be sure. That is why I call it when you sacrifice like that, you must have a minimum. The minimum means even if you are wrong, you would like to have this anchor. I call that the tactical anchor. Something that can that you that you know is gonna work. 
that you know is going to actually help you. And in a way, this is what you would like to hold on to, no matter what the case or what the situation. That is, I call that the tactical anchor. It's a very interesting concept. And, you know, it can help you big time, you know, if you go on to such a position, if you think about such a situation. Um, you know, uh, truth be told, the one thing, the one thing, that was so necessary is that white sold the perpetual. He had the queen to the d6 and queen e6. Wherever the black king goes, there could be different sort of checks, could be different tactical ideas. And uh, yeah, that was actually quite good. It was a great start. Don't know if it was a great idea, but it was a good starting point. Let's start with something that's going to scare black down. This is going to make him worry a little bit more than he should. And uh, it was nice. It's really, really good. Let's take a look and see uh, what actually comes next in the game. <clears throat> well, I mean, this is good, obviously. This is apparently a very strong move. So what did Black do? Seeing the danger and everything that's going to come down against him, apparently he didn't like it. And But he played after that King F8. So White can continue giving checks, or perhaps this is a time where he's going to figure out something more. This is where I want you to think about this position and try to figure out what, in your opinion, is the more efficient way for white, the most efficient way for white to continue the attack. So I got a question. Well, Larry, shouldn't we have been looking at it uh, uh, and talking about the sacrifice before playing c4? No. See, with the knight on d5, he can always come back and defend. c4, in a way, provided white with an opportunity to drive away a black strong knight. So that when the sacrifice came in, we realized the black king, black king is extremely exposed. And thereby, it doesn't have almost anything to keep himself up and in a good position. That was beautiful to play. It was very strong. It was very effective. And it worked out. It did, it did work out quite well. So, okay, we obviously need a lot more than that. We're not, you know, like ready with this. It, it was a nice shot. We did a good job, but um, so let's take a look and see. Very interesting type of move. What do we do as soon as black has moved this king along to f8? Anyone has an idea what should white do? Okay, so now one of you asked, like, how can we declare a move good or bad without considering the follow-up? When I mean the follow-up, I mean usually one that's required after a critical move, like when we make a sacrifice or when you're making a, let's say, a big committal type of move that you know will commit the position to something very specific. Then you need a follow-up. The follow-up always happens and you don't have to worry. But, um, yeah. Okay, what do we do now? Bishop F4. Perfect. Thank you for the suggestion. That was a great move. So White's just setting up. You know, he doesn't really even care about other stuff. Let's just bring over the bishop. We've got we, we've gotten the threat of um, a bishop to the d6 ready. The rest of the pieces feel perfectly fine. There is nothing to worry, nothing at all to be concerned of, and uh, it all looks good. Yes, definitely. Let's just make it work. In fact, after the move of bishop f4 and bishop to the d6, white is creating a threat. So it's not even a waste of time. Keep that in mind. White is just doing it in time. So every move is precisely following up what White wanted to initiate and outline from the very beginning. It was good. It really felt like that. Okay, that's nice. It's good to know that uh, White is following up the right moves. So what comes then? What's, uh, what's the right idea? What's the right continuation, so to speak? Okay, now, as this king, Black played rook d8. He realized that other defenses simply wouldn't work. I mean, if he tried bishop e7, white would have queen f5 check. Should the king go down to g8, there's c4, c the c5 with the idea of bishop c4. If you're not convinced by that, I'm going to show you. I mean, after c5, in case the black queen goes back there to d8, white can even deliver bishop c4 and, you know, queen e6. And after that, I mean, there's just so much more we can do. After king f8, there's rook e1. I don't think that it's necessarily awful for black, but then you realize a lot of the pieces just 
keep the tension, and black is in a real trouble after rook e1. That's why after 18, bishop f4, black saw the danger and decided, hell with this. Let me bring over my rook so I can actually sacrifice it if it comes to d6 and let it be over with. In the end of the day, he would be still a piece up. And yeah, I mean, he was a rook up. Exchanging for a bishop will leave him with a piece up. So what to do now? Now, queen takes d4? No, it couldn't happen. If queen d8 or queen takes d4 was going to happen, white would have played bishop d6, winning the queen, or even worse, checkmating the black king. So that would never have happened. He had to do rook d8 so he could stop the bishop d6 from happening. Now, I want you to think about this position. What is white supposed to do? Now, I just got a suggestion, which is very fair. Thank you. What if we play the move of rook e1? Interesting. But you know what this move doesn't do? It doesn't create a threat. It doesn't make a threat because what black, what black would do is could be queen takes d4. He's stopping our ability to go to d6. We don't seem to have a way to advance or go any, any further. And uh, honestly speaking, it is a bit, it's a little bit sad. We're supposed to get so much more from this, and uh, that's all we got? I mean, really? Nah. We deserve more. We need better. You see, so in some way, that's, I believe, what White wanted. He wanted to find a way to continue the initiative. C5. Absolutely. Let's push away the Black Queen from where it is. That's going to help us to free the route for our bishop so he can move up. And not only that, but we're challenging him. Now, I'm not going to say to you that White's attack is absolutely winning. No. I believe that Black's best shot would have been to take on d3 right now, which actually did, and, uh, you know, just defend himself. But then, you can never be sure. Tal's combination was ultimately correct. But when he started it, he didn't know that. In fact, if wherever Black goes now at queen a5, for example, I have to say he would he would lose due to rook e1. And if you're wondering why does rook e1 work now, it's because Black doesn't have queen takes d4 no more. So bishop d6 is a killer. Tal's idea was to neutralize the opponent's good pieces. Keep in mind, you can only be successful with your attack if you can keep your opponent down. We use all kinds of methods to do that. We use moves that will help us to push him back. We use different ideas. But, you know, the most important method that you care about in order to hold your opponent back and down is when you try, I mean, I mean, really, really try to restrict, take down his good pieces and never let them be. You never let them come close or come around in defense. So um, I think that's exactly what White uh, wanted, and he did it. C5 was a great move. So what comes next? Well, right after the move of pawn up to the C5, you could see Black's not well, hasn't got many options, so he played knight takes d3. He's a piece up, but it almost feels like an extra. That piece that he has is not in any condition not even close to helping Black get out of the trouble. Every single move that White does is moving him closer and up in his ability to attack the Black position. So it was a really strong candidate. C5, Knight takes D3, C takes to B. Nice. Now you're going to say, Valeria, this is easy. I'm a queen up. But look at the Black pieces. He's got three pieces out there. Three pieces that he'll use in order to try and make it more difficult for us to win. So how is White supposed to utilize his extra queen as an advantage? Now take a second and think about putting yourself in this position. Now what if he said, Rook d8 was a horrible mistake by Black. Wouldn't Queen d8 have saved him? Wouldn't that have been a good idea? No, that would have been terrible. If he does Queen d8, the queen is moving backward, and that simply weakens the defense. In that particular case, should Black do Bishop e7 to defend, White can just go back down with his bishop, and then you get to see that with the black, the black bishop being tied down on the defense and having so many threats like rook e5, I really don't feel like black is going to last much longer. Now, what about bishop f6? Well, that's the point, isn't it? We got rook f5 for the threat of bishop to the d6. That will be a pretty big kill. And uh, the king has nowhere to go. The bishop is tied down. And the rest of the pieces too. 
This is pretty big. So I don't think Rook D8 was a pretty big mistake, in fact. I'd say that it was a decent move to try and hold himself together. But um, why does White take the queen? Why not Bishop D6 now? Couldn't that have won the game? Well, it's a good question. Thank you for asking. If we did play Bishop to the D6, Black would have made a tempo move. You have to understand that in such positions, precision is everything. If you make an even one imprecise move, you lose. The only way for you to know if the move you're going to make is precise or not is to see the clear consequences that usually arise out of forcing moves, both for you and your opponent. He would sacrifice, then play bishop e7, and that's about it. We're two pieces down. Even if we take the bishop, we'll still be a piece down. So no. White wanted to just take the queen and enjoy this position. Question is, what to do now? Hmm. It's a really good question. So if the knight except for why not queen d6? Because we couldn't. He'll just take the queen. That doesn't work. So what now? How would you play it? Just think a little bit about it. White is in a good position. He's got a good development. He's got a good queen. He's okay. I wouldn't say that he's perfect, but he definitely has things to be proud with. So how should White advance his position now? Think about this from Tal's perspective. Tal was brilliant at converting an advantage. Now, while you're thinking about that, let me invite you to, to take a great opportunity and actually order Grandmaster's Roman Gingihashvili's um, course at a 60% discount. I'm going to send a link on the uh, on the chat, or you can check it below the uh, below the video. It's a brilliant, brilliant course. It's like it comes it comes with a with a fifty percent discount, and it's like a hundred and seventeen DVDs with over a four hundred hours of instruction for an amazing price of only a couple of bucks, a couple of uh, dollars every DVD. It's it's an amazing. An amazing offer that's only available for a few hours. So, check it out. Now, does anybody... Bdix A7. I do think this is a good idea. I do think so. Yeah. Why not? If we do that, we're definitely going to have the opportunity to step forward and attack him. So, yeah. You bet. This is a good-looking idea. And I like this. The most important about such kind of a position is let's keep the opponent back down. That's all we need. Let's keep him on the backside. Let's keep him back down and let's make him suffer. This move may not be absolutely brilliant, but what it does, I can tell you that, what it actually does is that it's just going to hold him there and make him lose the control. It was so good. It was really, really powerful there. You know, you don't always get to win games, actually. But what you have to understand is that a lot of times, a lot of times, you can keep him under pressure. So this is what we're doing in this type of position. So uh, after that type of a position, um, so like we could just have this great opportunity of keeping the pawn out there against the opponent. And, uh, you know, so this is a fantastic move. Okay, well, um, in the end of the day, with the black, uh, you know, piece, uh, the black force out there, uh, completely tied down, white is definitely becoming very successful. But it takes a little time to build it, to, to keep it. So what happened is that black played king e7. And the question is, what should white do next? Take a moment and think about it. What's white's best way to go? We've tied him down, but that's not for long. I think that last move of black wasn't exactly the best, but he wanted to cover the d7 square. So white can't break through, or he can't move in that quickly. It was, a, it was a fair move, I think. But didn't save him. Not after what White did. See, what White did was just terrific. So does, have, does anyone have an idea what White's got to do right now? Mm-hmm. A4. Interesting suggestion. Interesting suggestion. I don't, I don't mind that. But no. 
Mm -mm, not really. See, we're supposed to do something very different. He said rookie one or queen. No, rookie one could be one of the ideas. I completely agree. But, uh, you know, I think you have to use the pawns. See, I find it quite amazing how many people don't think about the pawns in the right way. They consider them to be just these insignificant pieces that don't add anything up to the position. A lot of times when a grandmaster uses his pawns, he uses them for two reasons. One, to find out an opportunity and just limit the opponent. And two, look up for a way to actually just restrict. So we're not really going to use it in any other way. Just look at how we, you know, you can limit the opponent and make him, make him worry. This was such a beautiful move right there. There was nothing to worry. It was a great idea, and it helped out a lot big time in this position. So with the move of pawn to b4, apparently Bly's got a lot to worry. He's got this uh, pawn coming down to the b5 very quick. And yes, Black can't take it because he's going to move away his good knight. So b4 really happened. Now, you're probably wondering, Valeri, this is crazy. Why doesn't Black take it? Well, because now we're going to play rig b1, and we're going to get that rook on the 7th rank quite quickly the moment he moves away. Got a strong pass pawn, really good queen, and the bad king to go after. So I'm guessing this will be painful. Well, I got to say, this was a really good idea, pawn up to b4, so black didn't dare to take it. He played rook a8. And what I want to show you the power of the well-coordinated strong pieces. White has less pieces, but they're more powerful than blacks. Because then, white opens up the position with b5. And then after rook takes a7. Okay, now if you're wondering, he couldn't take the b5 due to queen e6 check. And then queen takes d5. So after rook takes a7, white found a fantastic way to win the game. Okay, so what do we do next? How to play around here. Board and logo and are switching. I'm not sure what you're talking about. What do you mean board and logo are switching? Um, not sure. I'm not sure what that means. But I think YouTube had some problems today. So that's why I got a little bit late. Anyway, let's talk a bit about this position. White has to figure out a good way to set up the attack. What if c5 then bishop c3 support there knight? You gotta tell me a number of a move. So um, otherwise like I can't, I can't bring it like that. Now in here we have an inspiring position. Almost everything's right. I mean if you really check it, it's space, control, possibilities. It's all there. It really is. Everything is up there. Everything is ready. So it's just with one question. And we're good. We've got the queen, we've got the rook, we've got the pieces, we've got the possibilities and the potential. I love what white has. Okay, I'm not sure why does the board disappear, but I'm really sorry about it. It's got to be something with YouTube. This is weird. I'm not sure. Sorry about this. I have no idea why that's happening. Should be there at all times. Queen e6. No, black will just play king back to c7. That's that's not really going to work too well. Mm -mm. No, it's just going to run back. Running back is not good. We don't want to run back now. We don't want to let him to run back. So what else can we do? Take your time. Take your time and think carefully. It's a big position. It's an important position. And more, more than anything else, we need a clear goal to go about and, I don't know, set things up maybe. Does anybody have an idea? B6. Or B6 again. Or rookie 6. I like b6, but let's think about it. What if he just takes it with the knight? So, I mean, he would love to take it and then use that opportunity. You know what? 
I don't care about this. As I said before, in end games, everything's about activity. And I don't mean to say it any differently. It is always about that. And it's always been about that, really, if you think of it. Just make it happen. Make it work. The next move of white is absolutely fantastic and it just it really adds so much to the position and, and your your understanding on why white wins he is just supposed to play rook e6 check king c7 and then rook takes f6 which completely deteriorate deteriorates the white the black position by uh, falling the bishop and then the g7 i mean it was quite great but I want you to, sh to see the elements again of Tal's strategy and why Roman suggested that this game is one of the best classics. Number one, Tal's ability to actually build a strong position before starting an attack. So many people feel like the way to win against a strong player or basically play good chess is to learn how to attack quickly. And that is so not true. It is so different than what actually is there. In most times, we don't really care about fast attacks. Fast attacks work rarely, and on occasion, they may work, they may happen. But it's so rare, and it's so difficult, that I wouldn't really recommend you to rely on that. What you should rely on is the build-up, the activity, the control. Another important thing to remember is... Being able to keep that, those those pieces very strong. See, none of these moves would have happened if White didn't put his queen in g4. One small detail like this provides so much difference. The move of rook takes d6 completely busted Black's position, but it was only possible because we had the queen in g4, a little detail that seems insignificant at the time. But um, I think that... It was great. So Tal was definitely successful. Now, I'm still unclear about what was the black bish bishop's move in opening, if not bishop takes f3. Um, I think you should have just played bishop h5. You know, that was the that was the general caro count. Knight d7 here, h4, h6. It's okay. It's not perfect. It's not not, not brilliant, but it was all right. Still, it was, a, it was an interesting idea. This, the next thing is rook takes d6. Now... It's always beautiful to see such moves being played in GM games, you know, although they don't happen so often. And yet, when we get to try them in our own games, they almost come out like terrible, terrible moves with pretty much no value whatsoever. So how do you know if you could actually make or commit to a move like that or it will be a total disaster? Well, here is my simple suggestion. When it comes down to a move just like that, just like rook takes d6, ask yourself, what's the follow-up? What's the continuation? And more importantly, think about, do you have a good minimum? Because if you don't, well, that sounds something bad's going to happen. You know, it's that's a very clear indicator. Something horribly wrong is and would likely happen in this position. So stay alert and make sure that you don't give them the chance to, uh, you know, bother you, or like make sure that that uh, you know your your material attack is not going to compensate the material that you're giving. Why well, was just certain that he had the perpetual? He was certain that after bishop before the attack is constantly going, and at any point he wasn't in real danger, in real risk. Well, there's always a little bit of a risk, but it was small in comparison to what White was getting. And I love the pawn moves. I mean, this is, in my opinion, the best lesson. The pawns. Why? Because the pawns are going to help you clear the path for the rest of your pieces so you can get exactly what you're looking for. Attacks, tactics, resources. It was good. It just, that was really it. Very beautiful to follow. So, okay, this was an instructive example. And, um, okay, now I would like to show you something else. Now, uh, for any of you who want me to send to you this, um, in videos interrupting again and again, I'm not sure why that is happening, but it's not supposed to be happening. Uh, are you sure that it's interrupting? That was That's weird. It's not supposed to. Hmm. 
Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that's all right. Now, sorry about that. I, I don't know what ha what's going wrong. But but in, 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 just, just in case, if you actually would like me to send you uh, a sample of all the annotations, graphic commentary and all, just send me a message to the email, to my email, which is valeri.lilov at gmail.com. I'd be more than happy to give you my feedback on, um, you know, your games or suggestions, or perhaps just ask me, ask me to send you the you know, the PGNs of those games. I'd be I'd be really glad to do so. Okay, let's take a look at another game. Actually, this is a very this is a nice one. This is an interesting one. If it's interrupting, you have to try and set it probably at the lower resolution. Could be YouTube just messing up, uh, you know. So it's okay. Let's take a look and see another game this is another game another one of the games that was suggested by roman to be one of the very best classics and i think you would uh, you'd really like to see it it's blinking on and off i have no idea why that is i really don't that's uh, strange actually blinking on and off it's not supposed to be happening okay um not sure Interrupting looks. Okay, is this still happening? I understand that the that the the logo and the board are changing. Okay.
Okay, so hi guys. I just want to know if um, everything is working now, and if the if the sound is back on, and if the board is not flicking. I just got a problem, I think, with the YouTube. YouTube was actually interfering something. I have no idea, but I do hope that it's working out right now. Let's see. I'm just going to try and see what you guys have to try and say because I have to restart the whole thing. And, uh, okay. Uh, all right. So, can you can you guys hear me now? see all right let me see here let me see you're coming it's working okay now it works uh, thank you thank you for being patient with me today yeah i've had these technical issues so that's fine now let's let's continue from where we left off i was telling you that i wanted to show you some uh, other games that were really suggested by roman and one of them is actually quite brilliant. It was um, it was a game played by Bobby Fischer, Bobby Fischer versus versus Paul Benko, and this was a game that I find so beautiful and so instructive. So I I just want to share it with you guys, because Roman's way of of showing things is very very closely resembles the way Bobby played. It was simple, straightforward. And at the same time, very, very active. This game was played in the United States Championship in 1963 to 64. Um, you know, and basically Fisher was playing with white pieces. So the game started off with e4, black played g6, d4, bishop g7, knight c3, and pawn to d6. So up here, white simply did the move of pawn to f4. So what is White actually going for in this opening? This is the so-called Austrian attack. It is a really great opening because all that White wants or he's looking for is the ability to ste step up well, to have that these three pawns really controlling, or let's call it this way, commanding uh, most of the squares in the center. And by itself, it's just a very, very good deal. It's like, this is what we want. Let's get the control in the middle, and let's figure out what this will give us later. Um, okay, so that doesn't mean anything just yet. You know, it's, it's a good start, but that's all. So what happened next? After f4, Benko played knight of six. Fisher did knight of three. Castles, bishop d3, bishop to g4. So I have my first question to you guys, a very important question. Now, I want you to think about this very carefully. White has a good position. Most of his pieces to control, and a lot of what, what he's got is out there. It's, it's a great position. But how do you recommend that White has to continue in this boat at this point? Think about this carefully. So what should White do now? Okay, now now one of you asked, okay, can you raise your audio? Yes, sure, hold on. I'm going to do that now. Let me see. There it is. Audio raising. Okay, that's got to work better now, I think. I hope. Hope it works better. Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> what do we do? Now we do go for the move of on pond H3. Yes, please. Let's never let the opponent to have strong or powerful pieces inside our territory. The moment he gets these pieces, we're going to be in trouble. So that's why I say stay away. Just let's play with a move like pawn to the h3. You know, forget about the rest. They don't matter. The important thing is let's just, you know, navigate the opponent's pieces away from our territory, away from where we stand, away from what we do. And when you do that, this is where you're going to get the advantage. So uh, I think that was fairly important. That was a good, was a good start. FH3. One of the things that Fisher loved to do is to not give the opponent any ability, any time, and, and chance to stay stronger. With h3 and the actual exchange after the trade and the take back, 
knight c6 and the bishop e3 move, we realize not only that the pawn on d4 is going to stand much stronger, but also white has gotten this long-term advantage of bishop pair. It's just so beautiful. So black played e5, now surprising. Yeah, he wants to surprise us. He wants to prove that the attack that he's making is, well, let's call it this way, more significant, more successful. So how do we go about this position now? It's a strong-looking move, apparently. He's going for a tactic, we could say, in the line. He wants to be successful. He wants to deliver certain attacks, and he would like to do it all rather quickly. It's not anything bad, but we've got to act fast. We've got to be quick about everything. So I'd like to hear if anybody has something to say about this position and White's best move. So okay, h3 and then g4. No, I don't think so. We could play d x d e, or you can do something else, but uh, I don't think that matters. What really matters about this position is that we go ahead with something else, okay? After black's last move of pawn up to the e5, what we can do is play d dix to the e, d dix to the e, and then f5 is the move. It's a terrific candidate. It's really, really good add there. So we, well, something that you get to realize is that uh, it's just, it's beautiful. I mean, you know, it's like a, a fantastic idea. The opponent doesn't have anything to do. And uh, for the most part, he doesn't have any ability to, to just to just change anything in the position. It's so good. Fisher knew that the whole concept of being strong is just about making sure you keep a good command for each of your for each one of your pieces. So that happened. It's a good start. Uh, well, I mean, What's going on next? Is this enough to do that, or is it not? I think it is. It is a good setup. So after the move of pawn to the f5, the development really feels quite fantastic. So black played g to f. Now, don't ask me if you did a good job or you didn't. I don't think that this move was actually any good. But then after you played with g to f, white captured with the queen, and then black played knight d4 attacking. So Fisher knew he had an advantage. He was quite aware of the fact this position is great. But we need to know how to go about this. So let's keep it simple. Unless you have something really strong, similar to the game of Tal. Fisher knew also that it takes a while to build up a serious attack. We've already created the weakness. So how would you suggest why you can go from this position? Hmm. What should we do in this case? Solid looking rook, a good queen. It's all working towards black and his position. I really love the way on how white's got it all. But that doesn't answer the question. How do we prove that whatever we do is going to work? Take a second and think. a good game. Just that one question. You know, bishop g5 is a good move, but then black will just challenge us with f6. I don't mind it. Just don't think that it will be too good. I don't think that it will be too effective. See, white, in my opinion, wanted something else. He wanted something better. I call that expanding. Now, remember this principle. Roman actually talks about it in many different ways. I like to call it expanding. This is my own term. And what it basically means is that we're taking on the opportunity to, to gain more space, build more control, and, and then just do it by advancing. The move of queen g4 was not only a very strong candidate, but it helped white to expand by bringing his queen onto a very big position. It's going up to h5, and while I believe a lot of people would not see why this is so good, it felt right. 
So Black wanted to prepare eventually F6 or F5 to challenge it. He knew he was weak, but given that White had no direct threat, so Black's just going for it. He wants to do this. Now, I D5 maybe uh, would have been a good move earlier, but Black would have challenged it. So I guess he didn't want to do that. So he played this. Now Knight D5, it doesn't, it doesn't look good. Can we try bishop takes d4? Well, I guess we could. But you see, that needs to be very well calculated. Because if it's not, we risk to lose everything. All our advantage, all our pressure, activity, everything you've built, everything you've been fighting for. You know, it's uh, it's really easy to, 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 to mess it up, so to speak. So I guess uh, Fisher didn't really want that. He, he wanted to have something else. Strong queen, good bishop, and an important rook. How do we advance at this point? Rook f6, no. He'll take it. That wouldn't work. <laughs> it's not going to work in this case. Rook f4, you'll still take it and then play f6, you know, or f5 maybe. No, that's not good. So what do we do? And so much development, so much preparation, and in the end of the day, we lose it all. <laughs> it just doesn't sound right, you know? Okay, now you recommend that what we do, or what we should do, is to play bishop h6. Now, I, I don't find that a bad move. I actually think it's good. He plays rook g8, we can ch change, but... It wasn't the best, no. Not an exchange, not a sacrifice. What we want is, see, when you are planning an attack, you have to outline the main obstacles. This is what I call, like, figuring out the obstacles, and it's an essential part of leading any attack. If you don't do that, you'll likely have a hard time in being able to produce any serious threats. What do I mean by that? Well, Figuring out the obstacles ultimately requires you to find what the opponent will do. One idea that he gives that he can make f6 and queen g6. That's one obstacle. He'll challenge our queen. Another obstacle is f5 with which he can block our bishop. And a third obstacle is the fact that we don't have enough threats fast in time. If we try to improve, it's just going to fail due to black's easy way to counter. So what Fisher figured out was beautiful. He figured out that the exchange in d4, followed by the move of rook f6, is going to be the most beautiful tactic. And it was so brilliant and effective. If black takes that, then we've got e5, and queen takes h7 is inevitable. So what we need to do is just come forward with the exchange. So like, so this is queen takes h7 is a checkmate. Now, black couldn't do this. He couldn't do this. He played king g8. And then what we do is play with e5. So the queen and the bishop and the rook, they're all together and they're all attacking. And yet, Portish felt like, okay, you know what? I can still defend myself. I can hold it all there. You can't break my position. You can't break down my territory. So I'm going to keep it safe. It was beautiful. Now, do you want to play rook takes h6? I think you could. But... If we do, if we do, there's going to be this very easy possibility for black to maybe even take on e5. and uh, Or maybe just, okay, this move fails due to rook h8. Okay, rook h8 and queen h7. Perhaps not. Perhaps just to take here and f5. I'm not sure. I think this one, despite our good strength, it may, it may give him a chance to survive. I don't know. Perhaps no, but... Or maybe even actually after e takes f, he can play queen to e3 check and exchange our queens. That's not good. Nope. No, no, no. Something else has to happen. And uh, I want to see. You know, um, what is the ultimate goal of any attack? The, like somebody, somebody's going to say, I want to checkmate. Well, yes, that's the end result. It's not the goal, but the end result. 
You want to win material? Well, that's also more or less of an end result. Like the, that's the finale. The real goal when you start an attack isn't to do any of those key things. It is just about increasing the pressure. I got only one suggestion, I think, but it's such a beautiful move that white brings the knight on e2. And when the knight comes out to e2, you suddenly realize the black has nothing to do to stop that knight from coming down to the g3 or f4 and the opportunity for a breakthrough. All white has to do is to move that knight close, maybe to this or to that square. He's going to be closer. He'll probably do rookie one. He'll move his queen out of the way, set the knight one square closer. And you know what? There's nothing black can do to stop that. There is absolutely nothing. You can't take f6 because of the h6. He can't move the queen. He can't do a thing. Black resigned. It was so devastating position that he resigned. He realized there is no way on how, how that position can ever be defended. I mean, let's see on what he could do. Like what? What? What do you think he can really do out there? It's uh, like if if he plays a rook a to the d8, white can even just do rook f1. He wouldn't care. Black could do queen e7, and white can even do knight takes d4. Look at how awful that position is. Rook f e8, and then after rook f e8, we can do e takes d. Now white will be a piece up, and the, the rook takes f7 is coming. What I find so beautiful about Fisher's game, and I understand now where Roman suggested this game so very much, is that the development and everything that White gained in the opening really helped him in the longer run. More than anything else, what I find helpful is that expanding a stage. The one middle stage that I say matters most in between, in, in between the three. We have development, improvement in preparation, and attack. What most people do is that they develop and they want to attack, but true is it, it, it ain't going to work like that. You have to develop, then you got to improve, and then attack. Not just attack right after development. The exchange in rook f6 was only possible because of the perfect coordination of the white three pieces and the way on how that sequence worked out. Black couldn't have never taken the rook because of the e5, and when he moved, it was the same thing. The most beautiful of all was the move of knight e2 because this really helped white to keep that tension. And while black has nothing to do, white just brings more pieces, and it was great. I hope you guys like these examples. Again, if anybody wants to, to, to send me a message or ask me of anything, just feel free to do that via email, valeri.lilov at gmail.com. Or uh, don't forget that just for the next few hours, there is going to be this uh, promotion of Grandmaster Roman's uh, like full course of 117 DVDs. He, it, they're brilliant, essentially brilliant course, and uh, they're offered at a 50% discount, so check them out. I send a link on the chat. You can check the link below the video, and I do hope you like them. Again, I apologize for the technical problems today. There won't be any, I hope, next time. And I'll speak to you next Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much.